Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome, day two. Lost a tie, right? Relax a little bit. Everybody having fun? That's good. Sun's out. That's good, too. Uh, Sharks game last night. Who went? Good? All right. Uh, good first period, huh? 3-3, three, three, but uh, ultimately didn't, uh, didn't work out for the Sharkies. But for those of you who went, uh, I'm glad you did, uh, and I hope you had a great time. A couple of announcements for the group. Uh, tonight, town hall meeting. Uh, back at the hotel, it should be uh, a lively and engaging discussion uh, with some uh, law enforcement professionals and those involved in social media outreach efforts. Uh, and uh, in years past, those have proven to be uh, great experiences for, for everybody involved. So go ahead and hit that up. That goes uh, tonight from 6 to 8, Lori, correct? Lori? 6 to 8 to Town Hall? Back to the hotel. All right. And then tomorrow, wrapping up our conference, from 6 to 8, right back here at the Dome is our viewing of Heroes Behind the Badge. We still have some tickets available. They're $20 a piece. A uh, portion of the proceeds uh, goes to the uh, uh, COPS Foundation. And uh, we will have silent auction items available. And 100% of the proceeds from the silent auction goes to the COPS Foundation. So we're looking forward to that event. It should be very, very, very exciting. All right. Is everybody ready? Start day two. OK, got a couple of uh, fun factoids for you. And there could be a test involved at some point in time before we all depart tomorrow. Uh, because last night I was driving around, one, uh, one daughter went to volleyball practice, uh, son had the little league meeting, and what was I doing? I was thinking about Frank Demisio. Frank had a great presentation yesterday, it was very heartfelt, and uh, he's a self-admitted tech head in his mecca of Silicon Valley, right? There's a Yahoo sign right down the street, LinkedIn down the street, Apple coming up this way. This is it, this is it. But how did we get here? How did this get here? Um, very uh, got me thinking about some things. There's a very interesting news story last night on NBC 11. You can get online, Google it, uh, pull it up about the robust nature of the tech industry right now. This area is humming. We are coming back and we're really doing a lot of great things. Within a two day period this week, over $100 million in venture capitalist funds were put into startups in Silicon Valley region. What will that turn into? Who knows? Who knows? But it's it's our job in this room to, to be ahead of that, to be able to grab that with the power that we have and turn it into what we want it to be in regards to social media and our connection with the public. It's very, very exciting times. The term Silicon Valley doesn't just mean Sunnyvale or San Jose, Mountain View or Palo Alto. It's been expanded to include San Francisco. A ton of startups are starting in San Francisco now. So our region is expanding and it's only going to get bigger. The innovation is only going to get bigger, and we're all going to benefit from that. But how did it wind up here in Sunnyvale, where you're sitting? Some would say it has to do with the weather, eh, a little bit. Some would say it has to do with one of the greatest universities in the world being 10 minutes down the road, Stanford University. And some would say a small part has to do with where you're sitting right now. This dome was not always here. This land belonged to Lockheed Martin Missiles in Space. And the buildings that you see behind you are still part of that facility. At one time, starting in the late 50s and early 60s, 35,000 people a day came through the gates of this facility each day to work on some of the most creative and innovative and imaginative things that this country and the world has ever seen. The Hubble spacecraft invented, designed, manufactured right here. As a matter of fact, uh, up until recently, Lockheed Martin Missiles in Space was still in charge of that program, still a contractor uh, in that project. The uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles on the Polaris uh, submarines, built right here, deployed from here. And one of the most uh, interesting factoids throw out about innovation in this region, the Corona Satellite Project, back in the early 60s, when the United States was embroiled in the Cold War, uh, our intelligence gathering was very, very important to our security. And right here at this facility, the Corona satellite system was deployed. That system uh, photographed uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and other facilities throughout the world and dropped a canister full of film over the Pacific Ocean. That canister dropped through the atmosphere, was caught in midair by a military aircraft, 
and it landed right here at Moffett Field. That canister of film was secretly brought to a facility that's right down the street. As you're driving in from the hotel or driving out uh, later this evening, look to your left or right and you'll see a large blue building. It's a light blue building. It's called the Blue Cube uh, in layman's terms around here. It's a decommissioned de uh, Air Force base now, but at the time, that was one of the most secret facilities in the world, uh, dedicated to developing that film and controlling all of the intelligence from satellites uh, that was coming into the United States to keep us secure. Uh, the Cold War ends, and that brain trust goes somewhere. Where does it go? Out into the community to create the innovation, the things that we have now. That's kind of just a couple little factoids. There'll be a test at the, uh, at the end of today, and the winner could receive what's in this bag. So uh, keep that in mind. I hope you took good notes. All right. Um, any, any problems, any issues, anything anybody wants to discuss, once again, you can uh, tweet me. You can hit me at the end of the table. We'll get you taken care of. Try and adjust the climate today uh, inside the room here to keep it as comfortable as we can. And I think we're going to have a great day. Uh, some of the innovative heavy hitters in Silicon Valley are here this afternoon for a panel discussion. Uh, so you'll be able to ask them firsthand. Uh, about how you can use their services uh, to connect with the community. And uh, right now, we got Scotty Mills with us. Scott? <laughs> He's tweeting away. He is just tweeting away. He's good to go. Uh, with our first uh, presentation, uh, Scott Mills, constable for Toronto Police Department in charge of their social media uh, outreach efforts there. Uh, a true uh, law enforcement professional, a very important person to the Smile Conference for sure, is going to talk about the partnerships that we need to make social media uh, what we want it to be in law enforcement. Scott? Thanks very much. You're welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I want to uh, also uh, thank, uh, first and foremost, Lori Stevens for organizing this event. Uh, it is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, with her leadership, I think we can really make a difference in the world with these social media tools uh, with education. So, um, what's really great is uh, as we as you're looking up here on the screen right now, um, I've brought some guests with me, and we're really going to use those tools that Lori has taught us how to use over the years uh, in an effective way here to save people's lives. And I'm hoping that the synergy that'll happen from this little uh, presentation here will go around the world. Uh, through all of us and we will go home and make a difference and stay connected together uh, for the success and safety of our country, uh, of our world. Um, and the, there's a couple of hashtags that I'd like you to know um, that I'm very passionate about and, and if we can get our mindset into that right now for this presentation, it's uh, think global and act local. We can't change the world ourselves, but together we can make a big difference. And uh, we've got a great amount of people here. Um, as well, I'd like you to think of the hashtag uh, SmileCon, uh, which has been a hashtag that's been going for seven conferences over the past four years, where uh, Lori has connect connected people, and we've managed to connect ourselves with our roles and, and keep that hashtag going, keep it alive every single day and uh, just do our little part. One hashtag that we've been starting for this uh, 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 idea that we have is SSRTC. Um, I firmly believe as a police officer, I'm a Toronto Police Service officer, I work in corporate communications, I'm, my title is social media officer. Uh, we've got over 5,000 uh, police officers there and uh, we've got a social media strategy uh, designed by Lori. And it, and it, we're not perfect, but we're getting there. And uh, we'll never be perfect, but we're going to get there. Um, I'm also Crime Stoppers International Social Media Advisor, which connects uh, beautifully with the theme of this public and, poli and uh, law enforcement partnerships for success and safety. A lot of people don't know that Crime Stoppers are community-run programs at the local level. There's well over 1,300 programs in the world all registered charities at the local level in partnership with their local police services and their local media. And after this presentation, I'd really like to officially say that we're going to be partnered with social media. Because the bottom line is, we need help. 
we need funding, we need human resources, and we need training to save people's lives using these social media tools. And uh, I'd like to make a clear, uh, clear uh, call on Google as I stand up here today um, to, to come to the table and to talk and dialogue with us with, about what we're going to talk uh, about. Where we all fit in, our theme of the people that you see up here is we, we don't know where we're going, but we know we'll be there soon, it is very true. And if we don't talk about what we want and what we need, we won't get it. So what we need is a success and safety relationships and technology center, and we need it to be global. We need to think global. We need to act local. I believe that Crime Stoppers International is a great place to host something like that because the partnerships are already out there in existence, and we have to partner with law enforcement. Um, and uh, I, I really hope we can do that today. So by me saying that, in my role as a police officer, my role as Crime Stoppers International in a volunteer capacity for, for social media, um, I would like you to hear from some very key important people that I brought with me today. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, who we have here. Um, on the top there, uh, I'm just because she's up on the screen right now, I'm going to ask Anne Marie Batten if she can just introduce herself briefly and uh, say who she is and what she does. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Batten, and I'm a street nurse and a crisis nurse in downtown Toronto. My job involves the homeless community and street involved. As well. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Andrew. Andrew, will you uh, pop up there and say uh, who you are and where you are and what you're all about? Hello, California. Uh, I'm Andrew. I'm 25 years old and I have multiple disabilities, or I call them abilities, such as OCD, correct, ADD, and bipolar. Now, the main thing I want to get out today is. The last thing we want to do a crisis call is a SWAT team or, um, you know, or, you know, or teaser. So, I mean, what we want to do is get the regular police out there that can help us. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Do you use social media? I do a ton. Do you think that uh, if we work together that we can help people like you in social media as police officers and as social service workers? I firmly believe it. I, I firmly believe it. Thank you for helping us today on this Hangout, Andrew, and I hope you'll stick around and maybe we can hear from you right at the end with some inspirational words. For sure. Thanks. Our next guest is uh, uh, Jeff Brown. He's from Truro, Nova Scotia. And Jeff, uh, will you uh, introduce yourself to the room, please? Sure. My name is Jeff, and I'm the creator of the Facebook Leave a tip tab. And Scott and I have been spreading word about these uh, tabs that can be installed on any Facebook page. As businesses, community uh, pages, programs connect these tabs, we're creating success and safety in these communities. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, essentially what Jeff created about four years ago was a tab for Crime Stoppers that you can install on any Facebook page. And uh, essentially you can leave an anonymous tip into the back-end system. It doesn't go to Facebook. The app takes you back into the uh, back-end system of Crime Stoppers where we can effectively uh, help to stop and prevent and solve a crime together. I'd like to think that we can also reach out to help people that are in crisis that are experiencing mental health issues uh, with that. And that's when instead of help stopping, solving, and preventing crime together, where I'd like to take Crime Stoppers uh, mentality is success and safety. We're going to help stop, prevent, and solve crime together, but we're also going to advocate and facilitate success and safety. And we're going to have a few words about how we might be able to accomplish that. I'm very, very honored today uh, to have the next person who's going to talk for about 10 minutes to you, or, or maybe even 15 minutes. Um, she's my boss. Um, Lori would say, poor Megan. 
<laughs> because she has to supervise me as a Toronto Police social media <laughs> officer. Megan is the uh, the uh, corporate communications issue manager for Toronto Police. She's a civilian, and she's going to talk to you a little bit. She's worked directly with Lori on the implementation of our strategy in Toronto. She's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, where we're at, uh, where we've been, and where we're going. And she's also going to specifically address some of the key issues that are happening to us in relation to people posting on uh, uh, social media sites about suicide issues that quickly can become emergency management issues for us as police officers. And um, we're going to get in, uh, Anne Marie's going to talk about some of the other ways, collaborative ways, where we can do interventions where we don't have a conflict between police and, uh, and community members like Andrew, and uh, that we can actually deal with it, the situation without even using police resources if we're all connected and we're all working together. So welcome, Megan, and uh, take it away for uh, 10 or 15 minutes, sir. Oh, thanks, Scott. I was going to introduce myself, but you've uh, done a great job, so I, that's easily taken a, a couple of minutes out of my uh, rather informal presentation here. Um, hi, Lori. Um, I, I can't believe Scott's got me on Google Plus on a Hangout. Again, I never thought we would see this day, but uh, thanks to you. Uh, here we are, so uh, enjoying the fact that I'm in good company here and uh, that I am presenting at your conference once again, although I will say I would prefer to be there in person in San Francisco. Um, but uh, this will work just as well for now. Um, as Scott mentioned, We've worked together on the social media project for the Toronto Police Service for the last couple of years. Uh, we started off uh, with Lori in a very small working group uh, and putting together a strategy for us. Uh, up until that point, we had a couple of officers who were really uh, taking hold of our social media presence out there in the community. And uh, we had to uh, expand that and provide our officers uh, with training and procedures and uh, some strategies on how they could use social media because many of them were starting to use social media uh, without any of those things being in place. Uh, so over the last couple of years uh, we've done that. We have uh, training and we do have procedures and our social media presence has grown exponentially over the last couple of years. Uh, we now have upwards of 300 officers or units that are on social media. And right now, as Scott said, we're dealing with uh, a number of issues uh, that uh, we didn't even think of a couple of years ago. Uh, that's how quickly this project has grown for us. Uh, one of the key, more pressing issues has been uh, the issue of when people post threats of suicide on the Toronto Police social media accounts and how do we manage that uh, in, the, in the safest way possible. So it's one of the issues where we've had to draw in other areas of the service. It's not just a corporate communications issue. Uh, and we've had to tap into our community partners as well. And I know Anne-Marie will be able to speak to that. Uh, and along with that are the posts that we get on our social media accounts uh, that are emergency related. They may not necessarily be threats of suicide, but they're information that's relevant to an ongoing investigation, uh, or they could be uh, uh, threats of crimes to be committed. Uh, and we have to work very closely in those uh, situations with, uh, as I said, all areas of service uh, and our community partners, whether it be public transit or our school boards. Uh, to, to make sure that we get uh, an appropriate response. So those are the pressing issues that we have now um, that we're dealing with. We're also looking to do a better job of utilizing social media in our emergency responses uh, for events that are known to us beforehand, uh, you know, in, in, in case of protests or other demonstrations. Uh, for the purposes of, of getting information out to the community. Uh, we started doing that a little bit during 20 a couple of years ago, and we've looked at really expanding that into uh, our, our static corporate communications efforts for those events, uh, recognizing that social media is just as important to our communication strategy as more traditional forms of media, and making sure that we have 
element in place for those events. Uh, Scott, are there other things you want me to touch on? Really uh, appreciate uh, you joining us, and I hope you can stick around uh, for the rest of this here. Um, okay. Uh, Emery, um, can you uh, take over here? Um, I can just before I introduce Emery. Um, Megan mentioned protests and things like that. Um, Anne Marie uh, is a street nurse that was the street nurse for the Occupy movement in Toronto. Um, Anne Marie cares about people and all people. And Anne Marie has uh, been very instrumental in facilitating lawful, peaceful protest for everything from Occupy movement to Idle No More to to G20. Um, she is an absolute saint and she's going to give you four stories which are very important because they're hands-on stories of where we've been able to change lives and save lives because of our collaborative work in social media. Since I've been here uh, in the Sunnyvale area since Saturday, I've worked collaboratively with Amory on two occasions to prevent two suicides since I've been here. And uh, she's going to tell you about one of those that happened while we were here. She's going to tell you about three other situations. So uh, take it away, Emery. Um, thank you, Scott. I, I'm really happy to be here because as a nurse, the safety of our clients is also of tremendous importance to me. So how I first met Scott was for a member of the homeless community, and that's how we were started. I was introduced to a man, we'll call him Joe. Some of you may have heard his story. If you follow on Twitter, he has a hashtag, homeless Joe. So Scott gave me a call one day, said, I've met a man, can you help me? When he told me the history of how he had met him, I was shocked, but so incredibly proud of Scott as a police officer to have handled the situation the way he did. Joe was in Toronto during the G20, and he was actually calling out because of the region and threatening police officers. Scott took him aside. He took the time to talk to him, de-escalate him, took him to get something to him and started a relationship with Joe. Because of his illness, Scott knew that he needed some help. So that's where he called in myself. We worked together as partners with Joe, and we ended up effectively case managing him with smartphones. It's completely unheard of in the new world. I had no other way Track of Joe because he was my so called attachment. So I would get him to come to my area. If you're homeless, you have no address, how can someone be out of your attachment? The other trick was because Scott and I were using social media, we were still in contact. I didn't need a geographical boundary. So we would intervene with Joe, we'd check on him, get him supplies. At times he went missing. I put a call out on Twitter, has anyone seen Homeless Joe? Officers who knew Homeless Joe would go and locate him. He shared information. His condition deteriorated and we did need to take him to the hospital. We were able, without a police presence, to get him to hospital. He was admitted. It was a bit of a process, but there, there's a happy ending. And through this intervention and case management, Joe now is on disability. He has an apartment, and he's managing reasonably well. And here we are during this winter months, and this time last year, Joe was under a bridge. Without Scott's referral and without social media, this man's life would never have changed in the way that it has. So having that encounter, Scott and I started to 
more about immediate threats. And since then, we've had quite a few cases. The one that Scott's speaking to you about recent intervention happened just a few nights ago. And a male, we'll call Aaron, had expressed suicidal ideation on Facebook. He expressed this to a third party whose name is Scott and I. Through the third party, we got a message to him that I was going to contact him and I'm a nurse. I added him on Facebook. He accepted the friend's request. We chatted. There's an immediate trust type of relationship sometimes between who are struggling with mental health and nurses because we are a caring profession. I was able to get all of his history, his medication, his past admissions to the hospital. Through all of that, I found out that this man has actually had a tremendous amount of support in the past. He's actually needed the MCIT team to come to his place before. In Toronto, the MCIT team is a nurse and police officers who come in the case of an extreme emergency. In the past, police have had to respond. We were able to manage this completely on Facebook. He shared his community treatment team with me, and I was able to negotiate with his community treatment team for follow-up in the community. He never left his residence. Safe, secure, no police intervention, and he's great today. And his team in the community will pick up where we left home. We also have a case that's ongoing of a young female. We'll, we'll call her Nancy. Nancy has some um, social anxiety, depression. She also has a tendency for self-harm. She uses social media and puts calls out. She tends to tweet directly to police officers and ask for help. And what has happened in the past was that there would be concern for her safety and police intervention would be required. A lot of police resources were tied up and there wasn't really an effective medical support happening here. So Scott and I worked together with Nancy we, she now has an online community support team. We have communicated with her, her current supports, and we're actually all working together. She's actually a member of her team as well, and she has expressed to us through her lived experience that her life has improved greatly since the use of social media. She's able to identify a positive outcome and of interest to all of us, shared with us the reason he uses Twitter is because there's an immediate and a fast response when she needs it. And the alternative would be to call a case manager and leave a voicemail. Or maybe call an online crisis member and get put on hold. So we're out there we're on social media. It's effective. It's fast. And we're keeping people safe. The other case I'm going to talk to you about is a girl named Julie. Julie has autism and some personality disorder. This is an excellent example of how a collaborative approach can happen. Julie actually has court ordered supports in place in the community. However, coming out on social media, and had developed a whole online support group of various community members and, and well-meaning community members who really just wanted to help. She had effectively gathered two or three circles of people and she was tweeting to them messages of self-harm. So what was happening, all of those community members were all calling for help, police were being contacted, there wasn't one circle of intervention in place. So Scott and I intervened with her as well, gathered some trust, and it was a little difficult, but we were able to get consent to actually talk to her case manager. And in doing so, I was able to establish that her case manager 
didn't even know about all these online supports. And in fact, she wasn't a case manager's appointment. She was saying that she was coming to Toronto for help. So she was coming to Toronto for help, but the help was on social media. And in a way, we were all doing work, but not communicating with each other. And it was very detrimental to you. So since then, we're actively working together. And we've actually been able to have this manager join into our working group, which is very helpful to have someone doing ongoing things and to have their insight as well, because she's our piece of the following. So we've also been able to identify some trends through our work. So we do kind of have, if you think about in that, We've noticed more online traffic on nights, weekends, holidays, and the times where the traditional support systems may not be available. The other barrier that we've identified is that in many cases, nurses like myself, crisis teams, social service workers aren't on social media. In fact, in some of our cases, social media is blocked. So there's a big gap here and people are falling through it. So there's a lot of education needed. Training is going to be essential for online support. And I think the other piece is to keep a collaborative and a multidisciplinary approach, because that's really our goal, is just to keep everyone safe. Whether you're a police officer, a crisis worker, a mental health case manager, community member, and most important, we want to keep our clients safe and make sure that their goals are met. And that's what our working group is committing for. That's really our take on it. Thank you very much, Anne Marie. We really appreciate you talking with us and joining us today. Uh, your work is very valuable. Um, and uh, we look forward to future partnerships with you and many more people in social services. I noticed Thank that you. as we were going along here, that somebody that I didn't specifically invite into the Hangout, join the Hangout. I don't know if you noticed that or not. That's our newest Crime Stoppers program in St. Kitts and Nevis. Is there, some, is there a voice behind that uh, logo there? I don't think they want to talk. The, the bottom line is, so this is a perfect example of social media. If you're, if you're open, other people will overhear you, get inspired, and, and become part of the solutions. And you can just, uh, the, the, the power of an idea grows very big, very fast. So, so this idea is, is what we, uh, we want to do, a success and safety relationships and technology center. And why wouldn't you call it a social media fusion center? Because I've heard Ellie Dijon say this, and I've heard Lori say this uh, up here. Uh, this is not about social media. This is about people. And we had a great uh, conversation between Lori and Ellie and uh, Jeff Bangild from Toronto Police is here with me in the, in the car the other day about context. Everything that Anne Marie is saying about these situations involve context. There is not a company, a machine, or a program that can replace a human being for context. And uh, I, I commend Ellie Dijon for saying that because. Because what Ellie's advocating for with all this, these systems to, to you know, crowdsource an investigation and actually get out there and, uh, and see what the people are saying in social media, he's saying the same thing for the prevent and solve crime thing, mostly solving crime, as I'm saying, for the relationships and technology here. It's got to be human-based, and it needs human resources, which requires fundings and staff, and, and you, you have to get a purpose and a process together in order to get the payoff and the potential. And, and we have to think human beings because everybody that I talk to in this room, everybody that I talk to in social media and law enforcement worldwide on a regular basis says, we're burning out. We're burning out. And a lot of police budgets or law enforcement budgets, social service budgets are being cut. And a lot of the people that are taking the what we need money for to the table they don't understand social media in the way that somebody like Lori or Ellie uh, does. And, uh, and, and, and when they go, they don't know how to put that package together to say, we need funding for this. 
And so what, what we're hoping for here is, is a, a whole lot of education that happens where the proper people will get engaged on this and we will be able to go to get the proper funding and human resources and get our lives as social media police officers, social media social service workers back to where they need to be, which is balanced. Because we definitely have a, an issue with uh, staffing. And uh, if we can actually bring those models to our traditional funders, uh, you know, our, our towns and our, our states and our provinces and, and all the pro proper people, I think they'll all understand when we start talking in terms of using social media to save people's lives. So um, uh, how, how is this going to work? We're just talking the ideas right now. We've managed to actually get a meeting with uh, somebody from Google down here. It all starts with people talking to each other, and we have to share. I can't say this any more clearly. There is no I in team. This isn't about Lori Stevens. It's not about Scott Mills. It's not about Ellie Dijon. It's not about um, anybody else. It's about collaborating and, and being transparent and building that, and you build the house and people will come. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'm just going to minimize the Hangout. I'm going to bring it up again in a second. But I wanted to show you some key uh, messages um, where if you buy into what we're saying here, where you can bring it forward. Uh, this, is, this is my blog. Uh, the, the post that's up there right now is in the French language but it's the only post on there in the French language so if you go on it's it's been about 10 years of trying to gather different pieces of very important information to accomplish this goal and and it's all there um, if you uh, simply uh, the easiest way is to do a Google search for this type of stuff so I'm just gonna go to Google because even when you're searching a blog it gets a little different if you uh, are to if you want to know some of the best um, information that's out here for what a lawyer would say, um, we, we had a panel of lawyers and people like that. And as from the panel, I got that, that there, there seems to be a, kind of a, an old school and a new school. Uh, old school being adversarial and new, new school being a little bit more conciliatory and open and things like that. So we can't throw away the old school, but we also can't ignore the new school. And, and so um, there's a lawyer that I'd like to uh, uh, bring to you, education law. I just uh, Googled his name, Eric Rower, and uh, essentially um, what it comes up to is a, a spot on the blog there that has a whole bunch of information about what does social media and the law say. You know, a lot of people didn't want their pictures posted here, uh, or they didn't want to be live streamed for one reason or another. And the reason that was given to me in my capacity of, of helping to stream here was that they, they had clients that they were dealing with, and there's confidentiality and privacy issues. I just like to throw this out there safety trumps privacy. Safety trumps privacy. And, and we have to think in terms of success. And we have to think in terms of safety. So the picture that I put out onto the Smile Conference Facebook page to announce this Hangout on Air was actually the person referred to by Anne-Marie as Nancy. So if you go look on the Smile Conference Facebook page, you'll see a piece of graffiti art. I'm Graffiti BMX Cop. It's one of our graffiti projects where we do community building with graffiti artists instead of chasing them around with the goal of putting handcuffs on them and throwing them in jail. And Nancy came out and got over some of her inhibitions of, of being uh, afraid of the police. And if you take a look at Nancy's face there on that picture in front of a piece of graffiti art done by a kid that generally wouldn't have had a chance unless they met in social media a cop that was giving them a chance, and you look at that smile, that's the take home that I would like you guys, everybody in this room, to take home to your agencies and home to your home countries. There's six countries here. And how I got the permission to use that picture is simply tweeting at Nancy and saying, Nancy, you want to meet for a coffee in the mall? I'm passing by. 
And it was the day that I met up with Jeff Bangild, who you're going to hear from later, about tweaking his presentation here for the investigative end of things. And I said, I'm going to be near 14 Division where Jeff works, and I'll come by and see it at the mall. So I explained to her in person what was going to happen here today and asked her if she wanted to join the Hangout. She said, you know what, Scott, I don't even feel if I'm ready to join your SSRTC working group. I went one day, but it just causes me a lot of stress. And I said, you don't have to come. Just be a part. Do what you can whenever you can. That's great. I said, here's a good part for you that you could do for our talk is I wouldn't mind putting your picture out for the talk and saying you're a face of success and safety. I said, what's your favorite one? So I took a picture of her sitting in the mall, and she says, I don't like that picture. The one I want out is the one in front of the heart graffiti that we did. Okay. She gave her permission. That's all I need. She knows what we're doing. She believes in it. And she, she says that I would rather be able to talk to somebody by tweeting them. She, we, said, we said to her, why do you tweet emergency management issues? She says, because I know I can get the results I need when I can get them in a, quickly, in a quick way. I said, well, I'd rather you be tweeting with us about meeting up for a coffee than doing that. So that's what the Relationships and Technology Center is all about. It's about having a place, a physical place, making it like a franchise, saying here is this. If you want to do it in your community, here is the structure. Here's how you do it. And we actually have people from the community, perfect public and law enforcement partnerships. We have people from the community as we speak right now that have bought into this and they're writing up a business plan to try and go get the funding for it now. It'll be by the people, for the people, owned by the people, and the people will take ownership of the issues that we have, and they'll reach out and partner with law enforcement agencies that are struggling and maybe don't have the resources in place, and it'll be a place where law enforcement anywhere can pick up the phone and say, I got this issue, what do I do? And they'll be networked with all the Twitters of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Yahoos of the world, the LinkedIns of the world, and the YouTubes of the world, and the Googles of the world, as well as all the law enforcement people that have sustainable, sustainable resources in place to actually handle something like this so we can get a boots to the ground police officer to a door that we need to get at to get to that person before they're dead. How many people are up for something like that? I'm seeing a lot of heads nod and hands go up. So we can't do it alone. Um, we just plant the seed. So what I'd like to do is uh, um, I'd like to show you a, a little bit of a, a presentation um, because we have uh, about 15 minutes left that you can actually share. And um, it can, uh, again, I'm, to, in order to find this, I know it's on my blog, is when you want to find something, um, success, safety, uh, Scott Mills, relationships, technology, those are all the key words. Um, and you go like that and it comes up and you'll be able to click on any of these types of things. Relationships and technology is a, is a key thing. And what it'll come to, you'll eventually find a post where you can actually hear the lawyers, hear the other partners on videos and things like that. And you'll be able to see this presentation, which I'm not going to say everything that's in this presentation, but what I am going to do is I'm going to go through some key messages to end off here. This is all about relationships and technology key me messages. If we can think of these and bring them back to our purpose and process, we're going to get the payoff and potential. Adult mentorship in real life must be continued into the cyber world to prevent societal violence. Right now, there's a paradigm shift from legal liability model to policy-driven relationship and technology approach, which is essential for community safety. I know from working with people every single day for the last 23 years as a police officer that some of my key, key partners still have social media sites blocked. That's in capital letters for a reason. 
and I'm going to say it loud and clear on this stage. Stop blocking social media. Start community building and preventing violence with it. Relationships and trust between adults and youth are key to the prevention of bullying, gangs, suicide, threatening bodily harm or death, sexting, online intimidation, terrorism, and mass shootings. Who do adults include? It includes parents, teachers, school administrators, police officers, social workers, probation officers, justice system workers, correctional staff, and my friend Eric Rower, the lawyer. It includes lawyers. Even the Ontario Human Rights Commission, if you Google Ontario Human Rights Commission and, and uh, adversarial approach versus conciliatory re approach, all of the policies of people like human rights commissions in Ontario are all going to a more conciliatory report approach instead of an adversarial approach. And even people like the Special Investigations Unit who investigate conduct of police officers that cause injury to members of the public are now using social media tools to affect their mandate. That's absolutely amazing, but there's still some key partners that are being left behind. And we really need to think about that because social media is a vehicle for sustainable, connected relationships that, that create trust, which fosters reporting of concerns of violence to be dealt with by authorities before a mass shooting, before a bombing, before a minor little bullying incident, before gang involvement, and before suicide. The only quantitative anal uh, analysis I can give you of, of a success is that we used to have four officers that were assigned to the Community Crime Stoppers program in Toronto that went out and did PowerPoint presentations to school groups saying here's how you anonymously submit tips to help stop, prevent, and solve crime together. And our chief said we're no longer going to do that. It went by for a year. After a year's period, uh, the Crime Stoppers board begged our, our Toronto Police Chief, Bill Blair, to get the officers back to go and engage the program because they saw their tips in decline. And our, our chief authorized one person. I was fortunate to be chosen as that person. I can tell you in a two-year period, one officer using one little camera, using Facebook and YouTube for the most part, and then it graduated onto Twitter, now it's graduated onto Google+. In a two-year period from 2007 to 2009, we increased our anonymous tips to the Toronto Crime Stoppers program with one quarter of the staff from 300 tips a month to 1,000 tips a month. And a lot of those tips were not just to solve a crime, they were to actually prevent something. And as recently as about three weeks ago, we received an anonymous tip that allowed us to get a loaded 357 Magnum out of a school that was in a backpack of a kid in Toronto. Nobody's hurt, and we have the gun. We have to look at these models. In Canada, the anonymity of a Crime Stoppers tip is protected by case law of the Supreme Court of Canada since 1997. The case law decision is R versus Liepert, L-I-E-P-E-R-T, and Mr. Bob Gill is the lawyer that fought that all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, is currently the legal advisor for the Canadian Association of Crime Stoppers, of which Jeff, who's on this hangout, is a part of, and Ralph Page, the president, is following what we're doing very closely here. Alex McDonald is in Bermuda. He's the new president of Crime Stoppers International. He's following it very closely. John Lamb and, uh, is the president of Crime Stoppers USA, following all of this very closely. Very closely because we know that Crime Stoppers possesses the relationships and the caring people at the community level worldwide where we can work with community partners to save lives. And that's all we want to do going forward. Uh, I say Crime Stoppers is the key for social media. If you do need, we got about seven minutes left here. 
If when you leave here, if you buy into what's being said and you want to go out a policy route and you can't convince somebody in your organization or somebody at a budget level, you might be able to convince your chief or, or the head person, but there's just no money at, 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 the, at the political level and you need to go to outside uh, sources for funding. Um, the Ronald Noble, who's an American, the Secretary General of Interpol, in November 2008, after I spoke in South Africa to 189 countries, live translated into five languages at the International Fugitive Conference, they gave everybody else 20 minutes. For some reason, they gave me an hour and a half. Apparently, Laurie says I talk too much. After that presentation, Mr. Noble issued this statement, which is right here, that said that Interpol and all law enforcement agencies needed to use global police tools to track fugitives. And what he's talking about is social media. His mandate as Interpol is to track fugitives. Our mandate as police officers at the local level is to save lives, to serve and protect. It needs to be bigger. We have to think bigger. We have to include people like Amory Batten. We have to include people like Jeff Brown. We have to include people like Andrew Stewart, who's here, here today. If they want to help, we have to slow it down and involve them in the help. This man's a hero. I know we have five minutes left here. His name's David Bradley. When I did this presentation, he's a school safety hall monitor at a high school in Toronto that's got about 2,200 students. When I first did this presentation and put it together, he had stopped 15 suicides by seeing on, online what had been posted and, and accenting the situation. At this point in time, he's stopped over 16 teen suicides because he becomes friends on Facebook with the kids and uh, he sees their posts and when they're in crisis, he reaches out and helps them. This is what he posts. It's day two, it's Tuesday, it's raining, bring your umbrella to school. He's just a, he celebrates success and he always promotes safety. So me as the police officers on there, and he's always advocating for crime stoppers that you can call on the phone, leave an anonymous tip on the web, you can text a tip. There are a few apps out there. Apps are a big, uh, a little bit of a learning curve and a bit of a controversy right now for crime stoppers due to the anonymity. Um, but there are apps out there. Uh, we need to investigate that more. We need to slow it down. We need to take a look at it all, make sure it's working, get the right people involved. Everybody out there is afraid a lot of times that somebody's going to say something bad about us. That's the bottom line. It's about being in control and having somebody say something bad about you. I'd like you to think of this concept, social alchemy. It's a situation of taking something bad and making it good. You can take a bad situation where somebody's tweeting a suicide and get a picture of what's on that Facebook right now. Somebody's standing there smiling and being a productive human being. But it takes time, investment, human resources, and teamwork. So there's some examples. Twitnik, a uh, little shout out for him. He's up for a shorty word in activism. He's a kid I met in a school presentation. If you feel like voting for him, uh, go to Twitnik and cast him a vote. He's trying to get down to New York City to be honored uh, for a shorty award for his activism in social media. Got all the time in the world for him. Kedre Brown, Bubs Art. I tweeted into the Smile Conference, a, a, a talk we did at the 140 Character Conference down in New York. Two graffiti artists, myself, and a homeless advocate named Mark, Mark uh, Horvath. It's 50 minutes long. We all agree that was the best video we've ever done for collaborative community and law enforcement partnerships. And if you guys could watch that in a quiet time and hear what's being said, we were in New York City and we basically dropped the, dropped the hammer and said, if we want to prevent a terrorist attack, we can. We can, but we have to work together. We have to work together. I personally have been involved in a situation where we've stopped a mass shooting like the Newton County shooting or Virginia Tech shooting, because people that were in audiences where we were speaking before have reached out and said to us, there's a guy with a gun that's going postal on my Facebook. I'm capturing it, sending it to you. We action it. We actually go out and arrest the guy and get the gun before it happens. Toronto Police just collaborated recently, 55 division officers, with somebody in Arizona that arrested a female a teen 
that was about to do a school shooting and seize three guns. Because it was taken seriously when a radio call went out that there was a YouTube message that was saying that that was going to happen. I'll leave you with this. We're going to Omaha next. We got about two minutes left. Here's why we want to do this. Darcy Tierney's not here, but I'm sure she's listening. We started a smile conference two weeks after she told me, Scott, because of the dialogue that we're having at this conference, I'm going to tell you that one of my colleague's sons left a suicide note on Facebook after he was kicked out of school for a minor thing, went home, got his dad's service revolver, came back to the school, shot and killed the vice principal, wounded the principal, then killed himself. I would like everybody in this room to think, this could be any one of us, could we have prevented this situation with relationships and technology? That boy is dead. Two school administrators are dead. It's one of our colleague's sons. And this is what he posted on his Facebook before he went and did that. Everybody that used to know me, I'm sorry, but Omaha changed me and screwed me up. The school I attend is even worse. You're going to hear about the evil I did, but that school drove me to this. I want you guys to remember me for who I was before I did this, before I greatly affected the lives of the families ruined. I'm sorry. Goodbye. If any one of us, in the exercise of our duties, whether we're on duty or off duty, saw that post, how many people would act on it? Put show of hands, how many people would act on that post? We're talking a lot about professional, keeping professional and personal separate. We need to do that. But I can tell you, if my colleague's son is a friend of me on my Facebook, and that said, I'm going to be doing something about it, regardless of whether it's professional or whether it's personal. We can save lives with this. Arizona, Congresswoman Gifford, those are the victims. Do we hear about them? Could we have stopped it with relationships and technology at a strategy right from the grassroots up? Within seconds, I could find a video uh, that the shooter did when he was in high school that would cause me to want to do an intervention like we were doing with Nancy and all the other people that uh, Amory. What can we do? We've got to make social media the top priority, massive education and training. We've got the hope, the vision, and the action. This man started crying after he saw one of my presentations. He said, in Paducah, Kentucky in 1997, he witnessed three kids shot and killed as he was the principal of the school right in front of his eyes. He made it his life work, Mr. Bill Bond. He made it his life work to make sure that never happened. After one of these presentations, he walks up, he's in tears. He says, I got to quit, Scott. I can't talk your language. He said, Bill, you're the man, you're the stick, you got the passion, you got the love. You're also the head guy of the Principals Association for United States of America. All you got to do is sit down with somebody that's doing it and follow them. So we sat down for an hour, started up a Twitter account, a Facebook profile. He started to smile. He said, you know what? You're right, Scott. Before we sat down there, he said, we're losing a generation of our youth. I have to quit because I'm no longer effective. After one hour of sitting down and setting up an account, he says, I don't, I have to do this the way he talks. He's from Paducah, Kentucky. He says, I don't even have to change one slide in my presentation. Just ask the people to be my friend in social media at the end. And that is the truth. I work off a of Gmail. For the most part, Scott Mills with one T at gmail.com. If you email me, I will get back to you. If you send it to the person with two T's, Scott Mills at gmail.com, he's in Arizona and he hates me. So Scott Mills with one T, and uh, we'll go out of here for a second, and I'll just uh, bring up our guests if they're still here and see if we can't just have a little goodbye from them. Um, if they're gone, they're gone. Are we all still here? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Amory, you want to say goodbye to everybody? Our time's up. Sure. Um, goodbye. I'm really happy I had a chance to speak to you. Have a great conference.
Great. Thank you very much, Amory. Big round of applause for Amory. <laughs> Our next uh, person is Jeff Brown. Jeff, do you have any final words? The big thing I want to say is now that you've heard it, it's time to act. It's time to make a difference. Thanks a lot, Jeff Brown, Halifax, Truro, Nova Scotia. We have uh, Megan. Do you have any final words, Megan? Just want to say thanks, Scott, for including me in this. And uh, Lori, thanks for all your help with our social media project and your continued support and advice. I know I uh, rely on you a lot to uh, help. And, and Scott, I know everything I know about social media uh, thanks to you. So uh, you are, uh, you're, you're not as much trouble as you make yourself out to be, but you can be a handful sometimes. That's the thing. <laughs> well, I guess the world knows that now. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Megan, for uh, joining us. Uh, just before we get the last word from the reason we do this, last word here is from Andrew, then we're going to cut this off. I'm not going to say anything afterwards. He gets the last word. Andrew started a group called the so Success and Safety Relationships and Technology Private Group Center. It's a community on Google+. Tomorrow morning when we do our training, I'll show you what it is. Mike Downs, who you're going to hear about uh, in Kerry Blakeman's uh, pr presentation from United Kingdom, has started up both private and public law enforcement networking groups. To me, it is the best opportunity we have to work collaboratively for public and law enforcement partnerships going forward, and I'll show you a little bit more of that tomorrow. But uh, we'll end up here uh, with... Uh, with uh, Andrew, and uh, I'd like to thank you before Andrew says his final words, and uh, uh, look forward to continuing two more days of this conference and having a great time and keeping networked with all of you for success and safety going forward for our future. So, Andrew. Hi there, guys. First off, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, secondly, um, maybe one voice can change the world. If you can put a voice out there and change the world, it's a big effect on one person. One person makes a difference. I've had the privilege of having parents, a sister, and um, family members always there for me. And I want to get back and I want to be there for you guys. And if you follow on Twitter, my name is over there at AndrewSWD. I believe firmly with social media and mental health, we can make it easy. It's not annoying. We can, we can make a team together, and um, with me, luckily, I never was hospitalized, but I was close to it, and um, I had the privilege of knowing Scott, President and the privilege of knowing all the front of police and social media. Um, it's been a big part of my life. All right, that's the end, folks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can we get another uh, warm round of applause for Scott? <laughs> Great job, my friend. I told you we were going to relax a little bit today. We're going to open up our minds a little bit. We're going to look at some new stuff. Uh, and we were going to innovate. And, and my takeaways from Scott uh, in that presentation, innovation and payoff. What is your innovation going to be? What is your payoff going to be? Scott Mills has a legacy, has a social media legacy. Lori Stevens has a legacy. What's going to be your legacy when you leave here? Because that's what that was all about. Okay. Lori, do you have something to... Okay. Give us two minutes to get the next presenter up here, and we'll keep the show rolling, okay? Thanks, everybody. Go ahead and stretch. <laughs>